Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome back. I'm with John Coleman, my partner, and John Mariani, our virtual gourmet, who is a gourmet of virtually everything. That's, fi <laughs> that's fine. Eating as fast as I can. <laughs> John, it's good to see you. You are a man, since we go way back, I happen to know that you are a man who enjoys a good cocktail. I do. I do. My, my cocktail of choice was my father's, and um, I don't drink it in honor of him because I always loved a well-made daiquiri, mm. which is so difficult to get, so difficult to get well-made that I carry well -made, a card yeah. with me that has a recipe. My business card has a recipe for a simple classic daiquiri on the back. Two ounces rum, teaspoon of sugar, squeeze in one lime, shake with ice, pour into martini glass. How much simpler could it be? And they still. <laughs> yeah, well, when I was uh, when I was a young man, uh, particularly working in the garment district, uh, my drink of choice was gin and tonic. Uh, so th that's that's what I sort of remember uh, the hard liquor days, if you will. What about you, uh, Mr. Coleman? Well, I'm I'm going to say that I uh, I have passed the stage where I was interested in Boone Hill strawberry wine, <laughs> and and I'm now a bourbon drinker. But John, I have a question for you. I know that all, all bourbon is whiskey, but not all whiskey is bourbon. Did I get that right? What's the difference between whiskey and bourbon? Whiskey is a general term for distilled brown spirits as opposed to gin and vodka which are white okay um so brown spirits or brown goods as they're called in the industry that's those are all whiskey rum whiskey uh, bourbon whiskey rye whiskey scotch whiskey uh the word itself comes from the scottish whiskey bow uh whiskey which means water of life which curiously enough sounds an awful lot like the russian term for vodka vodka Vodka, whiskey, and they both mean water of life. Um, so Scotch whiskey is the original whiskey that they would be would be made up in Scotland and in uh, in England in those days. Well, in Scotland in those days, going back hundreds and hundreds of years, and that was made traditionally with malted barley, and they put the they put the barley malt up into um, uh, like a, a warehouse uh, loft where it's hot and it would start to, start to germinate and it would create this malted barley. Um, that's what makes scotch distinctive. Unfortunately, over the many years, the scotch um, producers uh, by law say, oh, you only have to have a certain amount of malted barley in there. Okay, okay, 51% would be nice, but they don't. So there could be other grains in there. There could be rye, there could be wheat, okay? The best um, scotches, the ones that we talk about today, a single malt scotches would be 100% malt, and they have a far more distinctive flavor, which is not to say that my father, who drank, or at least had on the, uh, on the cocktail table at home, he had Dewar's White Label and J&B and all of those scotches, which were premium scotches, and a premium scotch simply may, may, meant it was of a higher quality than um, a regular mill, regular scotch, okay? So you had regular scotch down here, you had premium scotch, then you started to have, uh, um, uh, within the premium scotch category, you had the various uh, regional ones from ILA and from the Highlands and the Lowlands. So, and they each had their distinctive character. The ones in ILA are very, very peaty. They use a lot of peat uh, to create the, the fire and the smoke that filters through the barley. Um, now, what happened was that brown goods, especially scotch, was going way down. After, after my father died, <laughs> the, the sales really dwindled. He was not a big <laughs> But sales of all brown goods went down um, around, the, around the world um, in favor of vodka, thanks to my old friend James Bond, once again, and his famous martini, in favor of gin, in favor of white rum, which went into margaritas and uh, very popular drinks like that. So the, the generation, just, just around the start of our uh, uh, glory days, John, um, the late 1960s and 70s, 
brown. I mean, nobody really ever thought of ordering. Give me two fingers of scotch. Um, then fade it out. So what's the scotch producers going to do? So they started coming up with, let's push the single malts, which are much more expensive to produce and to market. And uh, we'll also do uh, a single malt uh, from, uh, with 23 years and 25 years old and 50 years old. Now, that's a curiosity because what it means by law is that if you put 25 years on a label of scotch, what it means is that the least old, i.e. the youngest scotch in that bottle, is 25 years old. The other, the rest of the percentages in there have to be even older, okay? So if you buy a 10-year-old scotch, the, the youngest in there is 10, 10 years old. There could be to 25-year-old because scotches are all blended blends, okay? So when you talk about single vintage scotches, when I was in Scotland in the 80s, I asked about vintage scotch. You never, ever put a vintage on a label. And the distillers themselves, the master distillers said, it's, ah, it's a bunch of BS. It's, it's nonsense just for, just for marketing. And because vintage, all scotch is blend, a blend from various years, 25 years old, 20 years old, 10 years old, last week from a little bit from Islay, a little bit from the Highlands. So it's always a blend. And that's why you have a master distiller, a master blender at it. And they said, it's all nonsense. It's just marketing. Well, they was basically saying that all the scotch in this bottle came from one year, let's say 1997, which completely defeats the whole purpose of blending with scotches from other years. But it was a selling point. Okay. So, uh, and they've been very successful. The problem is that the so called, not the so called, the industry Scotch Whiskey Association, which funded, <clears throat> had a great deal of money to re to kickstart uh, Scotch sales again. All of the marketing and the ads went into these single malts and the, the expensive ones um, uh, at the top, the, the Glenlivet and the Macallan, and they always put a T-H-E in front of it, <laughs> you know, and they, it was five times as expensive as a Dewar's white label, um, and it was, um, <clears throat> and it had a more robust flavor, but the producers of the Dewar's and the J&B and all the others were getting pretty antsy about the fact that we're pouring all this money into this campaign to drink more scotch, but by pushing the high-end ones, you're really denigrating all of us. So that leads to bourbon. Um, first of all, rum is made from sugar, or cane sugar, or syrup, or molasses, okay? That is what defines a rum, all right? It doesn't have, uh, it doesn't have a grain like, like rye or, or, okay, bourbon by law has to be made with 51% minimum corn. Now, even the very finest bourbons rarely are made from 100% corn. That, again, would be a selling or marketing point. So there's always some rye in there, and there's also all, sometimes there's some, some wheat also, because these things were abundant in Kentucky where bourbon originated. Um, what really distinguished American whiskey in Kentucky, which is called bourbon after Bourbon County, um, the name itself comes to the Bourbon Kings, was that a guy named Elijah Craig uh, used a charred barrel and aged it. And people say, you know, this is much better than this moonshine that we're drinking uh, around here. And that's where bourbon came from, which is distinct from rye, which would have to be 51% rye, and the rest could be wheat or something uh, or anything else. So, um, although the more corn, the better, um, bourbon... Again, going back to our fathers and, uh, and uh, ourselves, a bourbon was a category rarely drunk uh, outside of the South. And it used to have names like wild turkey and um, that. And they were kind of cheap, cheap whiskeys, you know. Um, so, too, the same brown goods uh, decline that hit scotch it hit bourbon County. Nobody was drinking it anymore. Nobody was drinking rye. That's another story we can get into another time, um, because there were there were there were vats and vats and vats of rye whiskey lying completely fallow, uh, being not drunk until recently. So, what are they doing bourbon? Uh, a guy named Bill Samuels Jr. 
who was the son of Bill Samuel Sr., was making a small batch bourbon called Maker's Mark. It was a good one. It was a very, very good one, but it wasn't 100% corn or anything. And Bill Samuels Jr. said, I'm going to market the hell out of this. And he started to take ads in the New Yorker magazine, which included instructions how to make the perfect mint julep. The first um, instruction of which was take a Haynes number six T-shirt, put the fresh mint in leaves in it and wring it out to get the flavor of the mint. Well, this is hilarious, but it seemed to have, because in the New Yorker, it seemed to have the, 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 the veracity of truth that this is the only way, this is the perfect way to make it, and you got to use Baker's Mark. He also dipped his bottles in red wax, so a very distinctive bottle that didn't look anything like, like the other bourbons. Well, Baker's Mark started to <clears throat> go through the roof. All the other traditional bourbon makers around Kentucky took a look at that and said, hmm. We better come up with something very cool. So they started to come up with single barrel bourbons, vintage dated bourbons, bourbons with, uh, there's one with a little metal, uh, the closure, the cork is a little metal closure with uh, racehorses that won the Kentucky Derby and so forth and so on. And some of them became cult favorites like Pappy Van Winkle. Pappy Van Winkle on release sells for about 38 to $40. If you could find a bottle art john you would probably pay up as of twelve hundred to three thousand dollars for it what's wow. about it nothing it's a very good it's a very good um a bourbon it's a delicious bourbon but um it's just a joke that it's better than uh i would say most of the top bourbons out there on the shelf uh the really really good ones are going to be about forty fifty dollars uh, you spend $100 on bourbon, you're getting into one of these marketing ideas. And also the idea of a single barrel bourbon is based on the idea that they have all these barrels ready for blending. And one day, Isaiah, who had been there 40, says, whatever happened to that 1947 barrel we had up there? And it, it's still there. And we tasted it, and it was the best damn bourbon we ever had. We don't have to blend this. We don't have to do nothing but release it. Well, that's great, and it did so well. Uh, curious thing is they kept finding more and more. Every single year, <laughs> they found an unending supply of those old, untouched barrels. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> funny funny how that uh, that can happen when you need more profit. Oh, in <laughs> Indeed. Oh, listen, my uh, my picture's going fluey, I think. Well, I think I, so. Uh, I think it's because you've had a little bit too much to drink at your. Uh, I've got to I've got to close up this bourbon bottle with a without a cork. Yeah, John, it has been a great uh, <laughs> a great tour through uh, spirits and the marketing thereof. It's it's yes. great stories. I appreciate that. Thank you. Anyway, we'll see you soon, oh. uh, and I'm going to sign off because my picture's going south. Uh, so while I still have a picture, let me say thank you and uh, remind the, everybody the, to go to johnmariani.com. The ice is melting in my drink here, so. Uh. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's what it is. It's all your fault, John. <laughs> we'll see you soon, John. Thanks. So. See ya. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends, Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life.